Welcome to MMA Heat, the show that is all about heart, endurance, aggression, and technique in MMA and in entertainment. I'm Karen Bryant, once again back at the Fortune Gym in Los Angeles, California, and here's what's coming your way. We're going to go on the mats to both see and learn some great jujitsu. We're going to hang out with Robert Drysdale at his place in Las Vegas, see why the MMA stars go there to train. We'll head over to PKGLA and see why it's a mecca for the lighter weight classes. And we're also going to check out Fabrizio Verdum's very first ever Samurai Jiu-Jitsu tournament. But let's get things started with Robert Drysdale. He's the BJJ coach to guys like Randy Couture, Vitor Belfort, Forrest Griffin, just to name a few. You may even recognize him from The Ultimate Fighter Season 8, where he was Frank Mir's assistant coach. He's a former Abu Dhabi champ, undefeated in his own MMA career. And now is your chance to get to know one of the most important trainers in MMA. First and foremost, I want to know how long you've had this location and how many schools you have around the world. Well, I've been here in Las Vegas with this location for close to three years now, and uh, every things couldn't be better. You know, uh, Vegas is the place to be, and uh, my place kind of became like the place to go for jujitsu, and um, yeah. that's kind of what I wanted to be. And, I'm very happy with the results. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. And uh, as far as uh, uh, our affiliate program, we have affiliates worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, we just keep opening them all, all the time. We have three in Brazil, two in Canada, eight in the U.S., six in Poland, one in Ireland, uh, four in Australia now. Just expanding nonstop, nonstop. And uh, that's kind of the plan. Make it a, a global project more than a local project. So is there um, a certain teaching technique that you have? Because you've trained some of the most famous guys in the UFC and in professional fighting. Is there a philosophy that you like to bring to the game? Uh, I mean, like obviously, jiu-jitsu is my specialty, so I focus on that. I don't, I don't go out of my realm of knowledge. But I try to adapt to things that work. I, think, I, mean, there's, I call two different categories in jiu-jitsu, functional and dysfunctional. The dysfunctional is what looks good, but it's not what actually works. So I, I try to focus on things that are that are uh, uh, can be applied. Anyone could apply. Anyone could use. Something that's going to work in sport jiu-jitsu, someone that's going to work in submission wrestling, and something that's going to work in MMA. So often, you know, I'll be showing little small details regarding a rear naked choke. Oh, I know how to do a naked choke. Oh, there's a lot there that you don't know about. There's a lot more to it than simply going like this and trying to squeeze, you know. There's there's a lot more technique to it. So I think my jiu-jitsu is very, I wouldn't call it basic, It's I call it functional. Just basic things that work. So a lot of times I'll be, I'll have an advanced class with like eight black belts on the mat, and I'll be showing an armbar. But I'll show them ten details regarding the armbar they've never seen before. So so they know the armbar already, and I'm showing them things that are going to make that armbar better. Something they're going to be able to use in the next class, the next time they train, the next time they fight. It's not something that's going to take them 10 years to master. So I, I'm, it's not that I'm against uh, learning thousands of new moves. I focus on teaching you little small details that are going to make what you already know better. And I've definitely spoken to some fighters who've said that after they retire from MMA or whatever, they're going to just focus their life on jiu-jitsu. I guess it's one of those things that yeah. you can keep doing it. I mean, I yeah. guess it's the story of the development of it anyway with yeah. Elio not being as physically fit or able to do something, and that's it, why it, he was able to do it. It's a lot of fun. I think that people that, once they get into it, actually, uh, uh, they're willing to learn and go through the process yeah. of learning the art. They, it's addicting. Yeah. I've never seen someone quit jiu-jitsu because they didn't like it. I've seen people quit because, hey, my girlfriend doesn't want me to train or I don't have time or whatever. I've seen people quit for a number of reasons. I've never seen someone stop training because they didn't like it. I've never seen that my, my whole life. <laughs> uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's like, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a mind game, but it's also physical. You know, like I think a lot of sports, a lot of combative sports, even they're, they're, there's a lot of physical aggression involved. And jiu-jitsu is more of a chess game. I was just going to say, Yeah, and like people always make that analogy, yeah. and it really is. It, it's, it's like a physical chess game. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so challenging, because it really is one of those things that you never know enough. You know, I've been doing this exclusively my whole adult life. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I, I, there's, I know nothing. Like every time, every time I go to a competition, I see something completely new. It's like I've never thought about that. I'm angry at myself because I've been doing this my whole life and I've never thought about that. And there's always something new for you to learn. And even the stuff you know, it's not perfected. You know, so I, I know a thousand sweeps. I'm good at three of them. You know, so like I have all those like 997 sweeps for me to perfect. Is there a, any advice you have for somebody who's coming into your gym for the first time? Somebody who's seen jiu-jitsu maybe slightly intimidated or just really unsure my advice is you know it's fighters aren't that tough in the first place <laughs> they really are they really are <laughs> they just act like they are deep inside they're all soft and uh you know just it's not that big of a deal it's not 
you know, I, th I take fighting very seriously. You know, I love what I do. But at the same time, I don't see jujitsu as something serious. You know, at the end of the day, it's jujitsu. You know, there are important things in the world. There are things that are far more important than jujitsu. So, hey, go in there and have fun. It's not, world peace does not depend on jujitsu. Robert is half American and half Brazilian, so he's able to teach in English and in Portuguese. Yet another reason he's so in demand. Don't go away, though, because when we come back, Robert is going to break down the arm bar, teach you the right way to get somebody to tap. Oh, mmm. Uh. God, it's getting hot. Man, the heat. I can't stand it. It's the heat! It's killing me! It's MMA heat! You are watching MMA heat. <laughs> You're watching MMA Heat. I'm Karen Bryant. Still to come, Fabricio Verdum's Samurai Jiu-Jitsu Tournament. But it is time to go back on the mats with Robert Drysdale. Moments ago, you learned about his background in MMA. Now it's time for you to see why the best MMA fighters in the world want to learn from this guy. He's going to break down the ever-popular arm bar and let us know why little tweaks in technique can make all the difference. So consider that my opponent is defending the arm bar. Like, there's zillions of different ways of getting an arm bar. Uh, you know, a lot of people know the setups, but like this fighter can be a problem. You can get the armor and not be able to finish because your opponent is doing a great job defending himself. First thing I do whenever I, uh, uh, I get this armbar is I, I like to deepen my the top hand, the one that's close to his head. So this one right here is free. It's not incorrect if I'm here, okay, but I, I, there's less I can do with this hand than I can do with this one. So I always go elbow deep. I never go hand deep. This is a common mistake as well. Guys wrap the armbar like this and all Botch has got to do now is shrimp and his elbow is going to go to the mat. Lost him. Okay. So I always go elbow deep and I attach to my leg. Okay, see that attachment right there? Now if he tries to do the same thing, all he's gonna be doing is giving me the, yeah, he, he makes the armbar even easier for me if he shrimps. So this right here is a solid position. Another thing I do is what a lot of instructors will tell you not to do, and I completely disagree with them on this, is cross your feet. This right here is a much better armbar in my opinion. Some instructors are like, this is wrong, this is wrong. I've never heard a good argument why it's wrong. So I, I'm always crossing my feet. I think it's a tighter armbar, in fact. Uh, what I do keep in mind is that I always cross the leg that's on the bottom first. So I, don't, I never go like this. This is a little bit lighter because there's, there's some space here in between his face and my leg. Whereas if I go like that, he probably feels a difference. It's a little bit tighter. It's closer to his head now. And I do want to make an effort to keep his head down. Now I have a free hand. Whenever I feel that my opponent is trying to get to his knees, he's trying to get on top of him because it's a common thing for him to do, all I gotta do is wrap that leg. And there's no way he's gonna get to his knees if this leg is trapped. So as long as I'm controlling that leg, I don't have to be controlling it the whole time, only when he tries to come up. So as long as I'm controlling that leg, there's no way on earth he's gonna come up. So if he tries to come up, all I, I stop this right here, I go for the leg, I put him back, and I start all over again. And I still got a free hand, okay? So that's like an easy way of maintaining my position so at least I'm not losing control over it. Now, there are many different ways of breaking this armbar. Uh, I'll show you guys, a, 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 it's not the, the, it takes a while for people to actually grasp the concept, but once they do, it's, it's, what, it's a, a, a very popular one, okay? So let's say he's defending just like a rear naked choke, which is a common thing for him to do. So a very strong, very solid defense, because now this arm right here is protecting this one, and he's hiding his hand. Normally, the first thing I go for when I go for a, a, a attack, the, attack the arm, I try to grab his hand, and he's protecting it, so I can't get a good grip on his wrist. Very good defense. One thing I do is, whenever I'm putting pressure on his arm, what they normally do is they squeeze. They make, it, they make themselves strong, so kind of squeeze it. And if I squeeze, he squeeze, or both squeeze, and nothing's gonna happen. It's muscle versus muscle. May the strongest guy win. I always like to consider my opponent stronger than me, by the way, so I always force myself to make the technique as perfect as possible. So whenever I'm here, what I do is I relax. I kind of play stupid. You know, I kind of relax. He's not going anywhere. I don't have to be squeezing. I just relax. And he wants to take a break as well. So I feel him relax. You can actually feel his arms go, kind of relaxes a little bit because he wants to take a break. Whenever I feel that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to punch him. I'm going to punch his elbow right here with an open hand. Hit him as hard as I can and I'm going to bounce back with my back. So it's kind of like a surprise attack. If he sees it coming, it's not likely to work because he's going to be squeezing. But when I relax, he tends to relax as well. And when I feel him relax, that's all I need right there. Even if I don't pull his arm out the, all the way, if I get that right there, that's good enough. Because now I can reach for his hand. Now I can get his hand out of there. Connect the wrist and I fall back with my arm bar. Okay? Notice that I never, I never ever extend an arm bar without controlling the hand. A lot of people will tell you the thumb. The thumb is a good reference, but it doesn't have to be the thumb. It can be this right here. 
anything that keeps your opponent from rotating his arm. If he rotates his arm, there's a big chance he's going to escape. So I have to keep this right here. Not necessarily two hands, one is good enough, but you know, most people prefer two, it's a tighter arm bar. I connect the wrist, once I do that, I fall back. Another thing I do when I go for my arm bar is I don't put pressure straight down, which will finish him, but just in case he's very flexible, he may not tap from the, from the elbow pressure. So what I do is, what I, try, I try to put this hand behind the back of my head. So when I fall back, I extend the whole arm. Okay, and now what I do is I add pressure not only to the elbow, but to the bicep and the shoulder. So just in case he's got very flexible elbows, I made a much tighter arm bar by extending the arm. So the pressure doesn't go down, it goes up towards the back of my head. So when I fall back, much harder for him to escape because the pressure is this way. His way out is to pull his arm out. So by applying pressure this way, I make it a lot harder for him to get out of that arm bar. Man, he is good. You seriously owe it to yourself if you're in Vegas. You gotta train with Robert. And don't be fooled by the guy who tapped out. That is fellow instructor Rodrigo Bocci, who is also a BJJ champ and undefeated MMA fighter. Well, stay with us. When we return, we'll head over to PKG LA. I'm UFC President Dana White, and you're watching MMA Heat. I'm Karen Bryant. You are watching MMA Heat. Still to come on the program for Bricio Verdum's Jiu-Jitsu Tournament. But right now, it's time to head over to PKG LA. This little hidden gem of a gym is located off of Venice Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. Now, whenever Dan Hardy's in town, this is one of the places you can find him training. Former WEC bantamweight Chad George sat down with us and gave us a story on how punching, kicking, and grappling has put this gym on the map. So the gym is called PKG, which right. stands for Punch, Kick, Grapple. But, I mean, are those, you know, the fundamental elements that you're doing here, or is there kind of a philosophy that you guys like to bring to your approach to MMA? Yeah, you know, uh, our gym is primarily an MMA-based gym. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've built the gym off of is our, our boxing classes, our Muay Thai classes, and our grappling classes. So um, that's really where the name is. Um, I guess one of the core fundamentals we have is um, whether it's our fight team or our class environment is, is that our gym is, is a big family. You know, our members are just as much as the families, our fighters, our trainers, and it, everybody kind of comes together and it allows for just an amazing experience from the moment we open the doors to the moment they close. And how long have you been open? Um, we've been open three years now. You know, it's been uh, complete word of mouth. We've done no advertising, we've done no, um, no, no marketing. It's been complete word of mouth and we've got um, over 150 members to the gym. We've got a pro fight team, a full amateur fight team, a competitive jiu-jitsu team, so it's, it's good. Yeah, I was watching you guys work, and it seems that there's a nice um, alliance of guys around the same size. Seems like you have a lot of good guys to train with here. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it goes for a lot of gyms that, that have a good structure. Um, what happens is, a lot of times, is um, where the focus weights are, mm -hmm. um, it attracts those kind of guys um, as, far, as far as uh, weight and size goes. Mm -hmm. And we've been lucky enough that um, a lot of our guys that are, that are really high level that comes in, or even our up-and-comers, are in that same um, size range for us. Mm -hmm. And it just allows us all to train hard, get better and better. And it's, um, you know, uh, we're, we're all kind of like brothers. And, um, you know, that way if you don't fit in, you, you get beat up and get, and get kicked out. Right. So it's, it's, you know, it's good. <laughs> and it's tricky, too, because it seems like every day a new gym opens up, a new MMA gym. And there's certainly a, a period of which I'm sure you have to prove yourself that you guys are legitimate and stuff. I think it goes also a lot with, with the classes that we have. Mm -hmm. um, we try to structure our classes very much the same way all of our pros train except for the average person. 90% um, of our gym members of the gym itself have no desire to fight. You know, we, we, we average to people for, with, you know, full-time jobs, mm -hmm. with people that are housewives, which, you know, everybody to everybody, and we put them in an environment with people doing the same stuff that, that we do in our practices, except not as physical, right. not as, you know, not as much contact. Right. But so now they get a chance to kind of for at least one hour a day experience what we get to experience. And it puts them in kind of in a different world just for that one hour. Yeah. And it seems to be a, a great uh, approach at it because everybody seems to love it and they want to bring their friends to it and they want to tell people about it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and we love that they, that they do it. You're a professional fighter. Do you also teach here, though, as well, right? Yeah, I teach here. I teach privates. I um, actually have a clothing line coming out, so a lot of stuff going on, yeah. And what's that like making the, not that you're fully transitioning, because obviously you're still pro fighting, but is there something different you have to do with your headspace when you're trying to introduce somebody to the sport and, you know, just teach them the basics without 
overloading it with too much information because you know so much? You know, um, it, for me, it's not. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy teaching. For me, teaching allows me to work on my fundamentals and work on a lot of things that I need to work on. Yeah. So when we have new people come into class, I actually enjoy teaching new people. Mm -hmm. um, not every day, <laughs> but um, enough to where, you know, if I've got a group of, you know, 25, 28 people in my class, mm -hmm. I have all them working together and then I pull aside to the new people and I have them on the bag work on some simple techniques. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's fun to watch them progress. Yeah. There's something that's really um, empowering, I right. think, about coming to these gyms, and people shouldn't be afraid of that. I think people get intimidated. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the whole idea, I guess, of stepping into a, um, a fight gym mm -hmm. or a boxing gym or you know now now MMA gyms, yeah. um, the initial idea of it is definitely uh, probably very intimidating, um, and that's why one thing that we really try to do is for the, when people first come in is greet them with a smile. Mm -hmm. You know, let them know that this this is a, this is a friendly environment. You know, the um, pitbulls are friendly too. Yeah, the pit, yeah, yeah. Our dogs are friendly too. You know, um, actually. It's like some of our girls here, the ones you, you really gotta kind of like step aside of them. You know, we got some girls that'll. I can totally believe it. You know, and um, it's 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 great. You know, in fact, um, even though I say nobody, a lot of these people don't want to fight. We three months ago we did our first uh, PKG fight night, yeah. and that was just for members. Oh. Like it was closed off to everybody else. It was just for the members of the gym to fight each other, yeah. and if they wanted to. We, so we had we had four fights. Um, in fact, there's there's posters on the wall yeah. for it at the yeah. gym. We had four fights, and it was great. Like all the gym members actually showed up. <laughs> like we had over a hundred something members here yeah. just to watch their peers fight each other. It was unbelievable, That's and these cool. guys went at it. And we're gonna have another one here in a couple in about five weeks. Yeah, for nice the, for the PKG fight night too so it's 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 a lot of fun you know uh, our head boxing coach is the referee um you know we had we had you know one of the sexiest ring girls you could yeah. find as a as, as a ring Tiny? girl no it was, no it was me yeah. oh, you. it was me <laughs> <laughs> i really like that jim and if you guys want to know more about chad george's fighting career you can see an interview with him on mmaheat.com don't go away though because when we come back we'll head over to the samurai jiu-jitsu tournament I'm Hoist Gracie, and you're watching MMA Heat. I'm Karen Bryant. You are watching MMA Heat. We are all about heart, endurance, aggression, and technique. And it's time to see some of that in action. You guys remember Fabricio Verdum, of course, for shocking the world when he got Fedor Emelianenko to tap out to a triangle choke. Well, he is hosting the Samurai Jiu-Jitsu Tournament to bring together some of the best guys in the game. So why don't you sit back and enjoy the action from the mats. Hey guys, my name is Fabrice Verdun. I just uh, talk about, about the tournament, the Samurai Jiu-Jitsu Pro. Uh, it's a big, big, uh, big event. The first time I got it, Yai Lucas Pires, my, my partner. He, everybody like the, the tournament. They have uh, 500, 500 uh, people. It's very good. He, I'm very happy. I'm try the second one, the, the third one, uh, because everybody like. My friends, the Black Belt friends, uh, Galvão, João Assis, Dement, everybody say, Fabrício, congratulations. Not just me, but uh, Lucas too, because uh, it's not my idea, the Lucas idea. I, I just say thank you for my, my, my friends, my family, my, the, because this tournament is like a family tournament. Uh, just my, my, my friends help me, he, my, my wife, my, everybody help me. I, I, I just say thank you guys, thank you, I appreciate it. Big up, big up, big up! 
Okay, guys, uh, here is Joao Cis. I am at um, Pyram in Long Beach, uh, the Samurai Pro Jiu Jitsu Pro. It's the first Verdun's tournament, Jiu Jitsu tournament. Actually, one of the best tournaments I ever ever fought because the guys doing giving a, a good money price, uh, awesome fights. Actually, today I did just big fights, so it's a good good warm up to the worlds in four weeks. So I'm really happy. It's everything doing good. I did two great fights with Roberto Tusa from Gracie Barra and Dementi. Awesome guys, uh, very experienced guys, black belts for a while, so it was very good fights. I, I believe I, I did my best because this uh, I got the win, so it was very good. Congrats again, Dejro. That guy is a beast. And we here at MMA Heat, we're happy to be co-sponsors of the Samurai Jiu-Jitsu Tournament. Well, that does it for us. Obviously, I want to thank everybody here at Fortune Gym for their hospitality. Great place to train, by the way. Remember, join our Facebook fan page. You can follow MMA Heat and me on Twitter. I'm Karen Bryant. I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.